Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. So this is the closing session for B-Side Tel Aviv. And we have, uh, guys, by the way, you're in the way. So we're getting started with our last session for B-Side Tel Aviv. If anybody wants to uh, get some upgrades to first class seats, we have them right there at the left hand corner. And uh, I'd like to remind you, we have an after party, which will begin at around uh, 8.45. You need to get bracelets from Celebrite in order to get into the party. The, the bracelets are outside at the Celebrite desk and they will tell you where the party is at. And I'd like to thank them again for their support. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Akamai for their support and to Tel Aviv University for hosting us. <laughs> we got Thank you. So we got this uh, great room for free and the coffee and the food because Tel Aviv University is hosting us this year and we're very grateful for their support. And now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Ezra, your MC, to introduce our lovely next speaker. So, hello, I hope that you had a good time at the break, that you did some good networking, traded exploit, zero days, and whatever. How's your day, Nakama? Uh, no, those are not. Those aren't sure though, with me only. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mary Mo. Mary Mo is passionate about incident handling and information sharing. She cares about public safety and security systems that may impact human lives. This is why she has joined the <coughs> grassroots organization I Am The Cavalry, which is composed by a few hackers that are in the Internet of Things and in the security of uh, devices, and uh, it's, it's quite relevant to our current landscape and threatscape. Mari is a research scientist at Synthet ICT and has a PhD in information security. She has information as a team leader at NORCERT, the Norwegian National CERT. Mari also teaches a class on incident management and contingency planning at NTNU the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Mary is our first surprise speaker, so I will be happy if you can give a clap to Thanks, it's so nice to be here in Tel Aviv. Uh, it's so hot, uh, so unusual for me as a Norwegian to come here, it's, it's great. So thanks for inviting me and to be a special speaker for you. So today I'm here to talk about uh, my hacking project, uh, which is pacemaker hacking. Um, uh, I also did this presentation at the Cyber Week conference, but I'm going to try to add a little bit more technical detail this time, and maybe even the videos will work. Let's see. So I am a security researcher, and I'm also a patient. Every single beat of my heart is generated by a medical device, a pacemaker implanted in my body. Four years ago, I woke up on the floor. It turned out that my heart had taken a pause long enough to cause unconsciousness. So to keep my pulse up and prevent my heart from taking breaks, uh, I needed to get the device implanted in my chest. This machine, this pacemaker, and this little device, it monitors each single heartbeat and it uh, sends a small current, electrical current, to my heart with an electrode to keep it beating. But how can I trust my heart when it's running on proprietary code and there's no transparency? When I got the pacemaker, it was an emergency uh, situation, so there was really not an uh, option to not have the device I needed to stay alive. It was however time to ask questions. So to the surprise of my doctors, I started asking questions about the possibility of hacking this medical device, if it has any uh, vulnerabilities in the software, the code running inside of my own body. The answers were unsatisfying. My healthcare providers could not answer any technical questions about computer security. Many of them hadn't even thought about the fact that this device is running code inside of me. This is why I started my hacking project. Imagine that this is your heartbeat. 
Wouldn't you also like to know if the machine that is generating each single heartbeat is secure? So can hackers break my heart? To answer this question, I decided to use the competence I have on IT security. Unlike most patients that get pacemaker at a much older age, and I started a hacking project together with some friends. How is the data generated my, by my own body secured? And is it possible for someone with malicious intent to access my data, uh, get my private data, and maybe even hack my pacemaker remotely via its communication interface? These are some of the questions that I tried to find answers to in my hacking project. So I did some research when I got the device. I was already working in information security. Of course, the first thing I did when I got the implant was to study its technical manual, which I could find easily on Google. And I saw that it had two communication interfaces, wireless communication interfaces, which got me curious because it also got me worried because as a security researcher, I know that with connectivity comes vulnerability. And we are, as a society, adapting connected technology faster than we're able to secure it. So this is my friend, the pacemaker. Uh, I expect, don't expect a lot of you to be medical experts and know how this works, so I'm going to show you a short video of it. A pacemaker is a miniaturized computer that is used to treat a slow heartbeat. It is about the size of a couple of stacked silver dollars and weighs approximately 17 to 25 grams. It is usually surgically placed or implanted just under the skin in the chest area. The device sends a tiny electrical pulse down a thin coated wire called a lead into your heart. This stimulates the heart to beat. These impulses are very tiny and most people do not feel them. While the device helps your heart maintain its rhythm, it also stores information about your heart that can be retrieved by your doctor to program the device. So did you notice the ones and zeros at the end of the video? That's what I'm interested in. So pacemakers are have been uh, technology, life-saving technology since the 60s. Uh, but this technology is also evolving. So this is an example of a newer type of pacemaker, much smaller one that can be implanted directly into the heart muscle. So you don't need to have the wires. And uh, uh, for my condition, I can't use it. But for other conditions, this is already available on the market to be used. This is how one of the pacemaker vendors imagined the future of pacemaker communication. This is a, from a YouTube video from a MedTech talk in 2010 by Medtronic. Uh, so they, they imagined that this tiny uh, new get generation pacemaker is talking with your smartphone or the Blackberry in this picture. Um, do you think this is the reality that my pacemaker can talk with my smartphone? What is, all, is already uh, out there, the future is already here. It's possible to have an app on your mobile phone that can talk to the pacemaker, but it's not directly to the pacemaker, it's via this wand that you have to place on top of your, your device. But it's already out there, it's already connected. And as I told you, when I did the investigation of my own pacemaker, uh, I made this uh, diagram showing uh, its communication interfaces. So my pacemaker uh, has a one wireless interface that uh, is used to program it. Uh, so this is via a um, programmer that they uh, have at the hospital. Uh, you get hook up, hooked up to this uh, via a wand that they place directly on top of your, uh, of your device and it communicates on a couple of centimeters distance. And via this interface you can change the settings and you can do almost everything with the pacemaker. But then there's another wireless communication interface that is being used uh, for uh, remote patient monitoring. So if you have this home monitoring unit in your home, it will connect wirelessly with the pacemaker uh, by preset intervals, perhaps once a day. So typically you might, might have this in your bedroom and it will start communicating uh, when you go to bed. It will retrieve all the log information from the pacemaker 
And this uh, uh, communication, uh, this range of this communication is uh, larger, it's like 9, 10 meters away. And we'll send your patient data over the internet or via the telephone line to a server at the vendors. And then there's a web interface that your healthcare professional can log into to retrieve your logs and your patient information. Of course, this is very beneficial for a lot of patients. They don't have to go that often into the doctor's office to have a checkup. And depending on your condition, this can be very useful and it can help save lives. Uh, but for me, this is turned off because I don't need it. And I was not even informed that my device has this interface. It was just when I read the manual that I discovered that, okay, I have this possibility of uh, communicating on like 9, 10 meters distance. And of course, this opens up for a lot of potential threats. So all along this chain, there can be vulnerabilities. So the device itself can, can be vulnerable. Uh, the access point can have vulnerabilities in it. The mobile network, I have to trust that one with my patient data. And also the server that stores all the patient information and this uh, web interface. So in my hacking project, we're mostly looking at uh, the device and its, uh, uh, its wireless communication interfaces. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong that can impact patient safety and privacy. So, and you also can imagine uh, attacks that would be specific for a medical device, like for instance, battery exhaustion attack. So the battery in my device is lasting 10 years. Uh, whenever it communicates, it drains the battery. So if, I, if the battery gets drained prematurely, I'll have to go in for a replacement surgery uh, earlier, which is not a good thing. Uh, of course, you can also imagine worse scenarios, like with the ransomware that has hit hospitals lately. They have been hitting uh, uh, the general uh, data systems, not the medical devices. But you could also imagine medical devices being hacked or uh, being, put, uh, being uh, held as ransom. And then there's the remote assassination scenario, uh, which I'm sure you maybe have seen in some movies or TV series. Uh, I just want to say that uh, so far no one has um, published any evidence that it's possible to hack these devices remotely via its uh, web uh, connection. So hacking my own heart. So part of the problem with doing security research in this field is that um, the code in my pacemaker was not readily available for me and my researchers in my team. So uh, as a patient, I'm expected to just trust the vendors when they say that everything is secure and safe, there's no vulnerabilities, and they don't let me look at the code. So that's why I, as a security researcher, wanted to figure this out and started the hacking project, which is actually a reverse engineering project. Uh, so this meant getting hold of the different devices, which was possible to do via eBay. So I went on eBay, I bought the pacemaker programmer for $500. Uh, it was a bit more problematic to get hold of the pacemakers, uh, but I've gotten several donations of pacemakers uh, to my projects so far, which is great. Um, so these are some of the pacemakers that we're looking at in our project. Um, several of these have been donated by supporters, uh, which I'm very grateful for. I'm, of course, not doing hacking of my own implanted device in the project, so I'm not, uh, not doing research on that, on that one. It will not be ethical. Uh, here you can see one of the volunteer researchers on my team uh, capturing the communication signals that I transmitted from the pacemaker. Uh, so here's the reader head uh, of the programmer. Um, sorry, I made my slides in widescreen and they're a little bit crushed. Um, so to find out how secure they are, we open them, uh, we find out how they are constructed and, uh, and we are working on, on reverse engineering the communication. Um, so sometimes I think about the coders that made the code running inside my body. Did they have a good day at office? Did I make any mistakes? Are there software vulnerabilities in the device keeping me alive? Of course, the hacking project needs to be done in a responsible manner. So this means that 
we are not yet discussing uh, any vulnerabilities or information uh, before we have done this in a coordinated way with the vendor. So we just had to wait for, for the real technical details. Because I do not want to scare fellow pacemaker patients from having a device or opting out of life-saving uh, medical equipment due to fears of hacking. Uh, but it's already established by other researchers that it's possible to hack these devices. I'm going to show a slide with some of the previous work. Um, fortunately, as I mentioned, uh, these types of attacks that have been proven uh, to be possible so far have required close proximity to the patients. So you, essentially you need to have a pacemaker programmer or your own version of that and attack me uh, with the tool and be like centimeters away from me or at least be in the same room. Um, so hacking of pacemakers via the remote uh, communication interface like you've seen on like Homeland uh, series uh, has not yet been proven to be possible. But not a lot of independent research have been done in this field. So that's why I'm encouraging more, more research on this. So this is summary of some of the research already done. So there's a, a group at the University of Michigan led by Kevin, Dr. Kevin Pu that has done uh, some hacking of pacemakers. So they published an academic paper on this in 2008. Um, and they're also work, still working on it. So they published some more. And then there was the late hacker Barnaby Jack. He was supposed to give a presentation at Black Hat 2013 about his project on hacking pace, pacemakers. So he essentially had made the device that could scan the room and get the serial numbers of pacemakers in the room and start communicate, doing man in the middle with, the, with those pacemakers. Um, I went to Black Hat and I was really looking forward to meet him and, and listen to his talk, but uh, unfortunately he passed away uh, one week before. So this research is also to sort of honor his memory. And then there's other uh, hacking of medical devices. Uh, you have the love hanging fruit, like devices, uh, uh, medical equipment on the internet that you can find by Shodan scanning. So Scott Irvin and some others did some research on that. Uh, they also made some medical device honeypots to see if, uh, if someone actually tries to target medical devices. And these honeypots got infected, but not by targeted uh, um, code. And then we had last year um, some uh, a work uh, by Bill Rios and others on uh, drug infusion pumps, which actually led to the first ever FDA recall of a medical device due to uh, information security issues, which I think is a big thing. This means that doing uh, white hat hacking and, and doing coordinated disclosure of uh, vulnerabilities means you can save human lives. Because this was the first ever recall, I think, that uh, the FDA did without having en any patients being harmed, uh, as far as I know, in, this, in the research. Usually they recall drugs because uh, they get reports of hundreds of patients dying because of side effects. So, I think that's also a great thing. But sometimes, trust is broken. I'm here today to tell my story, but others do not have this opportunity. Think about that. In this case, 13 patients died because of faulty cardiac devices. In 2005, two doctors went public with concerns after a 21-year-old died uh, when his implanted cardiac defibrillator short-circuited and didn't work when he went into sudden cardiac arrest and he died. It turned out that the vendor had known about this uh, short-circuiting issue since 2002 and they even tried twice to fix this. But they had failed to report this to the FDA, the, um, the medical device regulator in the US, so that they could issue and recall. I have first-hand experience of how it feels to have a medical device that is not working properly due to a software bug. So since I'm younger than most pacemaker patients, um, the default configuration didn't work for me uh, the first three months. They had to do a lot of trial and error to figure out what was wrong, why, why I had problems with my pacemaker. 
And the consequences of this have greatly affected my well-being. So a couple of weeks after my surgery, I went to London to attend a course in ethical hacking um, with some colleagues. And we went off the trains at, the, at this underground station in Covent Garden. And that was the first time I realized that something was wrong with my pacemaker. So we, we headed for the stairs because there were long queues to the elevators. As you see, I clearly didn't read this sign warning uh, that you should not climb the stairs if you have a heart condition. So I was walking up the stairs and then suddenly I got this feeling of exhaustion, like I could not go on. You can compare it to if you're trying to run uphill as fast as you can and then you get to a point where you just can't run anymore, except this happened to be an instant. And I didn't know what was wrong, but I realized there was something with my pacemaker. So when I got back to Oslo, uh, I went to the hospital and got a checkup. And this is how it looks like when you're checked up or debugged. So these are a stack of different pacemaker programmers um, that attach to the patient. Um, and there's a stack of them because they're all different, the different vendors have their different implementation of communication with the implants. So you need to know what type of implant you have and then you need to pull up the right programmer. So on this touch screen, with a touch of a pen, the pacemaker technician can make my heart go faster, slower, or even turn off the pacing completely. And I'm 100% pacemaker dependent, so that might mean that I would not survive if someone did that uh, maliciously. Uh, so the problem in my case was that the number shown on this screen indicating the upper heart rate limit that the pacemaker could follow was not the same number as the actual settings in my pacemaker. So there was a software bug. And because of this, it took a long time be uh, before they figured out what, why I got this sudden feeling of exhaustion. And I had this problem for three months whenever I was try trying to like, run after a bus or, or walk stairs. So basically, the settings in my program are suited to much, match the activity level of an 80-year-old and not me as a much younger patient. So whenever I hit 160 beats per minute, the pacemaker would cut my pulse into 80 beats per minute. That was what's happening. And I didn't see this because of this software bug. But once they figured this out, they could get the settings right, and now it's working perfectly. I even finished running a half marathon last year with a baby. <laughs> So I'm lucky because this technology saved my life. I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the pacemaker. But the decision to implant a medical device is also a risky one. But in my case, the benefit of having it clearly outweighs the risks. So on my spare time, as mentioned, I'm volunteering for the grassroots organization I Am the Cavalry. We are focused on issues where computer security in intersects with public safety and human life, and we work to improve visibility, awareness of these issues while preserving trust. And we collaborate among stakeholders, we deal with concerns, and we try to find a common way where everyone wins. And recently, we published this Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices that have five steps that we want the vendors of pacemakers and other medical equipment to adapt, adopt to make them more secure for the future. I want to mention that Bo Woods, which is sitting on the second row here, was very much involved in, in making this happen. So, thanks. So, no patients have, as far as I know, been killed due to hacked pacemaker. But patients have been killed due to software errors, due to malfunction of medical devices, and uh, configuration errors in their devices. In the future, many of you will also lead longer and healthier life because of implanted medical devices or sensors in your own bodies. But this technology might also kill you if not implemented correctly. And this is some uh, examples of research that I want to see the next five, ten years. Because security research in the form of preemptive hacking followed by coordinated vulnerability disclosure and vendor fixes can help save human lives. This is why I'm calling up on you, the technology enthusiasts, 
the hackers, the tinkerers, the doers, to go out and do more research on medical devices. To join me, to hack, to save lives. Thank you. I'm not doing this research alone. I have a lot of collaborators that are helping me with this, and I want to just give a tribute to all of them. Thank you.